questions for the uh, second lecture in this afternoon. Uh, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you Jorna Zelenska from the University of London, Goldsmith. And uh, her lecture, the lecture which she will be delivered by her is called What Can We Do with Crude Matter? The Golan Issue in AI, Art and Ethics. So, it's up mm -hmm. to you. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Hi. Do I need to switch off any of the mics? And the, the other one as well, the streaming mic. Okay. Um, just wanted to say thank you to the organizers for, for putting on this very exciting event and for having the courage to bring people from so many different playgrounds and hoping that they will come and play together for three days and I think so far it has worked very well and we are clearly coming from very different disciplinary backgrounds with very different disciplinary baggages um, burdens you might call them but I think this is what makes the conversation interesting it expands the set of possibilities and so far I've enjoyed the conversation very much I've been challenged been pushed to go into directions I didn't think I could go into and I still look forward to tomorrow um, is if to put uh, some cards on the table, I've already been putting my cards on the table kind of since yesterday, so I'll add a few more. Um, I'm an ethicist, I work on ethics. I'm not a moral philosopher though, I don't believe in moral philosophy. Now, it's not, I do not not believe in the moral philosophy in the same way I do not believe in unicorns or in God. I do not believe in moral philosophy in the sense that I don't think it works. However, I think there are reasons why people might want to do a moral philosophy, appreciate some of its edifices, the elegance with which it can be constructed. I work on ethics um, and I'll try and present something a little different today. A lot of the discussion so far at the conference has been around uh, trying to construct kind of artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, moving beyond that. We've had questions around robots, we've had questions around different forms of, kind of being in that kind of network environment. I would like to suggest that as well as putting energy into constructing different forms of artificial intelligence, I think we need to put as much energy into constructing ethics, perhaps constructing ethics again, anew, seeing how far we can go with this. So far, a lot of the discussion around ethics in the discipline has been around applying ready-made, kind of semi-functioning moral formulas or adjusting existing forms of, of moral philosophy to ethical problems that are thrown up by kind of developments around artificial intelligence, uh, artificial life at times. I'll try and kind of start the project from the other side, from the kind of rebuilding or uh, working through some of the ethical assumptions behind some of this. But also, I've, in my previous work, I've, I've done quite a lot of writing on different forms of robots and cyborgs. And today I'm planning to do something else, which is to talk about what I called in one of my earlier works soft robots, soft cyborgs which is kind of forms of being that um, uh, kind of coexist in a certain environmental um, relationality and in a kind of softer, less metallic, if you like, way. But perhaps it's just a metaphor. So the title of my talk, What Can We Do With Crude Matter, may seem to some of you to be principally a technical question. You may perceive it as articulating an engineering problem or asking a question about design. This question allows us to think about the practical possibility of bending raw matter in order to create things, of twisting, turning, and splicing that matter, of overcoming its resistance. Yet what can we do with crude matter is also perhaps first and foremost a philosophical question. It's a question about ontology or the being of matter. We need to understand what crude matter is in order to be able to do something with it. We need to understand its nature, we might say, that is its substrate and its behavior. But what can we do with crude matter is also an ethical question, one that prompts us to think what we should be able and unable to do in a moral sense. That is, what is legitimate and proper, what should be allowed, how we should regulate the transformation of matter in our society, and who should, be, who should we be given authority to engage in the process of molding matter? The scientists, the engineers, the philosophers, the artists. It's this ethical side of this question 
that will be of particular concern to me today. Yet before I turn to ethics, I wanted to explore several conceptual issues to do with the terms of our debate and of the conference as such. While trying to pose this question, what can we do with crude matter, we should also give some thought to who it is that is actually capable of posing such a question. What kind of cognitive, intellectual and institutional privileges are needed in order to be able to formulate it and to be in a position whereby its articulation will find an appropriate audience ready to discuss it? My talk today is therefore partly about this question and about the possibility of posing and reposing it from different philosophical and theoretical positions. The specific focus of my talk, however, is on the beyond aspect of the beyond artificial intelligence of the conference title. I'm drawing my inspiration here from Catherine Hales, who in her renowned book, How We Became Posthuman, has shown how in cybernetic research, as many of you will know, information and hence also intelligence had gradually lost their body and started to be seen instead as sequences of data which were seemingly separate from any material medium in which they find themselves. Starting as a critique of Hans Moravitz's 1988 book, Mind Children, The Future of Robot and Human Intelligence, Hales's argument goes on to engage with the works of computational biology and artificial intelligence going back to the early 1950s, when the cybernetic paradigm was first starting to take hold. According to Hales, many of such works presume a conception of information as a disembodied entity that can flow between carbon-based organic components and silicon-based electronic components to make protein and silicon operate as a single system. When information loses its body, equating humans and computers is especially easy, for the materiality in which the thinking mind is instantiated appears incidental to its essential nature. Moreover, the idea of the feedback loop implies that the boundaries of the autonomous subject are up for grabs, since feedback loops can flow not only within the subject, but also between the subject and the environment. Yet Hales points out that information always needs a material medium, be it a human body, a computer processor, or a multi-agential network consisting of different processes and entities even though those entities and processes seem to get overlooked or forgotten in the many attempts to engineer and transmit intelligence. In the disembodied view of information critiqued by Hales, intelligence remains burdened with the metaphysical baggage of the previous centuries, including the dualist distinctions between mind and body, materialism and idealism, transcendence and immanence. This dualist thinking is still to a large extent with us, as evidenced by the wise man of the last century Yoda in Star Wars V, The Empire Strikes Back. And Yoda says there, life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Now, so crude matter is clearly from this the opposite of life here. And for whatever strange reason, this phrase has been adopted by a lot of kind of new age websites. So go and Google the phrase, luminous beings are not, uh, we, are we not this crude matter? Lots of scary stuff on the internet there in relation to this. So it kind of got me interested, the kind of the positing of a certain model of the universe and the relations between different substrates. Crude matter is clearly uh, in the words of the wise man Yoda, is the opposite of life here. It's seen as something that needs an external intervention, a spark, an intelligence to make it alive. In this famous opera of cosmic good and evil Star Wars, crude matter is presented as just crude, inert, unintelligent dead. So my talk today is about redeeming crude matter as a site of potentiality, while at the same time bringing back materiality to the problem of artificial intelligence. And maybe it doesn't need bringing back, maybe it's already there. And listening to a number of talks from different people, I'm aware that it actually, you know, it doesn't perhaps need bringing back, it might just need highlighting or messing around with rather than, so I don't want to single-handedly take on this task because I think many people are already engaged in it anyway. So in other, other words, my aim is to give a little bit more body to AI. The golem as a creature of crude matter, at least the way I read this character, can help us with this project. I suggest we can see the golem's wisdom and practice as that of an anti-Yoda, as a redemption of crude matter, 
that always already inheres a potentiality, but also as an abandonment of an idea of a something else. Indeed, the Golem can teach us how to get our hands and minds dirty was a matter of matter, how to think and play with it, and thus with ourselves and our surroundings, in order to think and make intelligence, but also life, better. Now, mine is not any old Golem, though. I come to the Golem story and the way it engages with the matter of crude matter via the artistic practice of the Australian duo Oron Katz and Jonat Zer, who have set up a laboratory called Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia, running a research initiative called Tissue Culture and Art Project. In one of their recent presentations, given actually in Prague several months ago, the artists pointed to an emergence of an interesting phenomenon in recent academic discussions in the domains of cultural studies, media theory, and art. While life is being increasingly instrumentalized and isolated from its original context to become a product for human manipulation, matter, whether living, semi-living, or non-living, is attributed with vitality and agency. This philosophical trend, inspired by the work of Gilles Deleuze, Manuel de Landa, Jane Bennett, and others, has gained the name New Materialism. For Katz and Zer, this phenomenon blurs the perceptual and technological boundaries between what we consider living, semi-living, and non-living. One of Katz and Zer's recent artworks, which, like their previous pieces, is an attempt to explore precisely this instability between the living, the semi-living, and the non-living, is actually titled Crude Matter. The piece is concerned with the importance of the substrate, that is, the context for life. Drawing on recent biology research, Katz and Zer argue that context is as vital to the development of life and its differentiation as, if not more than, genetic code. Referencing a paper titled Substrate Stiffness Affects Early Differentiation Events in Embryonic Stem Cells by Evans et al., they point out that differentiation of stem cells depends very much on the extracellular matrices on which cells grow. Even a subtle change in substrate consistency will have a fundamental effect on the plasticity of cells and the lineage they will take. That is, what type of tissue they will become, fat, bone, this is the science that underpins the crude matter project, which is loosely based on the story of the golem. The artists explain the project in the following terms. We are exploring the alchemy-like transformation of materials into active substrates, which have the ability to act as surrogates and upon life. The story of the golem described the emergence of life from inanimate matter, mud. Light that was forceful but brute and could be precariously shaped for different purposes and intentions. Some say that the body, or the clay dust remains, is still in the attic of the new old synagogue of Prague. Our aim is to explore in a poetic way and bring back into the forefront the materiality of life in context. This is to differ from the hegemony of the metaphor of life as a code, and then following postulation that life can be controlled. Drawing on historical references taken from the Middle Ages, we would like to look at engineered life that is on the edges of what we consider animate or inanimate, and provided with some sort of agency, even if symbolic. Now, the installation you can see here includes local mud, ceramics, synthetic glass, tissues grown on the PDMS substrate, micro channels imprinted on glass. The artists aim to dig out soil from historically significant places, such as the banks of the Vltava River in Prague, from which, according to the legend, the golem has been formed, and from a 1942 crash site of a German Junker 88 bomber in the very far north of Finland. So, and then they intend to grow life from it, while also allowing it to die. Thus trying to understand the relationship between cells and their environment. The piece destabilizes for them the engineering logic of the transformation of life into raw material, to question the logic that seems to privilege the information embedded in DNA over the context in which life operates. Crude matter is touching upon the creation of life from crude matter and human knowledge, when human hubris and life should not mix. For me, the work of Katz and Zer is particularly interesting because it poses this question I asked at the beginning of my talk. What can we do with crude matter? In a way that takes issue with the humanism implied by it, what can we do with it? 
So I kind of would like to loosen up the relationship between the two. So it does pose that question, allowing to open up the humanism and kind of go deeper or against it, I'll show in a moment how, while also challenging the human hubris that underpins many of our contemporary Golem projects, especially those in the corporate biotech world. Katz and Zer are equally interested in what crude matter can do with us and to us, while also revealing that matter is not and has never been just crude even though it has suited us humans to imagine it in this way. Instead, matter has been other than itself, or to use another recently popular term, relational. There are a number of other artists associated with the label bioart, the way Katz and Zer also are, whose work takes this relational and contextual approach to the question of life and its locatedness in and emergence from matter. Bioart, or a genre of art, that engages with life in its fleshy material way is an area in which life is both put on display and put to the test. So let me show you some examples of bioart that is literally teeming with life. Our friends Katz and Zer have also grown a semi-living coat. It's a kind of baby coat, so you couldn't really wear it, but you can see it here in the glass capsule. It's grown out of immortalized cell lines which form a living layer of tissue supported by a biodegradable polymer matrix. Displayed in this glass sphere connected to various test tubes, this tiny garment-like object, branded victimless leather, brings to the fore the moral implications of wearing parts of dead animals for protective and aesthetic reasons. While engaging us in a visceral reflection on our use of living systems in everyday life. Now I wanted to say a few words about a project called Blender by Stellark. Many of you might be familiar with the Stellark's work. You might also be familiar, apart from the, uh, the kind of scandalous uh, ear on arm, uh, the kind of ear implant, uh, that sculpture that he has had implanted on his arm several years ago. Many of you might be familiar you know, with his robotic projects, projects that involve exoskeleton and different forms of kind of uh, uh, technological uh, processes that he's been working with throughout his career, including different forms of suspension events, these kind of harnesses made from different types of ropes. But I'm interested, as I said, soft cyborgs are my topic, so I'm interested in looking at this um, project called Blender, um, which was a collaboration with Nina Sellers. A project is a vibrant installation consisting of a large glass capsule in which liquid biomaterials such as subcutaneous fat from both artists' bodies obtained via liposuction, the materials kind of bubble and slosh about, accompanied by the regular clicking sound of the blending mechanism switch, which creates a pulse-like effect. We've got uh, now a Canadian artist, Tani Duff, who's got a project called Living Viral Tattoos. Uh, they are rendered in a petri dish on human and pig skin by viral vectors and immunohistological stains. And they are in turn foregrounding both violent and productive relations between humans, animals and viruses, whereby the bruising effect that stands for the tattoo represents the process of wounding as well as healing. And now again, to make a link with the previous presentation, uh, we heard from Jana about Eduardo Katz and his robotic work. And as well as doing kind of work with robots, my favorite work of Eduardo Katz from his robotic period is Rara Avis, this funny bird that kind of communicates and flaps its, uh, its wings and, and is uh, very clearly kind of manufactured, so non-natural to use our kind of vocabulary. Um, and, and at the same time, it kind of engages with a broader question of communication, relationality. However, we've got Katz's project called Edunia, which I would like to talk about briefly today. Um, this is a so-called plantimal, which is a combination of a plant and an animal. The plant being a petunia, you know, a flower, and uh, the animal being the homo sapiens, Eduardo Katz himself. Uh, so, it's a handsomely growing, genetically engineered pinkish flower, which is a hybrid of the artist and a petunia, with the artist's own DNA expressed in those red veins in, the, in traversing the, the petals. So, these are kind of some examples of bioart. 
I want to argue in this talk that it's not so much its daring or even blasphemous novelty or its serious yet irreverent interdisciplinary crossings that make bioart worth our attention. Rather, it's what happens to life itself within bioartistic practice that opens up the most interesting set of possibilities for artists, philosophers, scientists, engineers, and a wider public. These possibilities are not just visual, but also material, and thus, we may say, ontological. They concern the very nature of our existence in time, and of what we understand by the seemingly self-evident concepts such as intelligence, sex, and reproduction, and we had a discussion about that yesterday with Heimer's um, talk when it turned out that sex is not what you think it is, the body, and the very concept of being alive. In works such as those by Tissue Culture and Art Project, Stella and Cellars, Cats or Duff, life is being recreated, pushed to the limit, remolded, remediated, cut and spliced back again. Bioartists can therefore be said to take art's creative imperative to a different level. Uh, echoing um, to an extent what the philosopher Henri Bergson termed creative evolution, a form of life's unfolding which doesn't proceed in straight vertical lines according to a pre-designed formula, but which rather entails the possibility of creating some real novelty, or what Sarah Camber has termed life as we don't know it yet. This is not to say that novelty is desirable under any circumstances, or that it is inherently progressive and good. Nor is it to assert that bioart remains outside the dominant cultural norms, or that the creative impulse which underpins their practice releases artists involving in the manipulation of life at genetic, cellular, or tissue level from wider social conventions and obligations. We should therefore, by all means, give due consideration to questions concerning artists' rights and moral obligations that frequently get raised in debates surrounding bioart. Questions as to whether artists have the right to create and manipulate life and to play God, so to speak, the way Rabbi Loeb did with his Prag golem made out of the soil of the Tava River, whether it is moral to do so, and whether life as such doesn't deserve some kind of protection from the possible excesses of some eros irresponsible experimenters, excesses that the 20th century in particular witnessed in high number. So obviously a lot of scientists are asking these questions with regards to bioartists, thinking that it's rather unfair that scientists have to present their work to the ethics committees and it has to be uh, analyzed so carefully and they have to respond to so many different demands to, uh, to prove that there is a principle of non-harming, that they are really taking great care with it. Well, artists are seemingly allowed to get away with murder, sometimes literally. So I think that these questions are fair and they should be posed. However, I want to suggest that perhaps they are not the best questions we can ask about bioart, for the simple reason that they evoke a normative position on life, echoing the mode of reasoning that in philosophy and health-related disciplines goes under the name of bioethics. Traditional bioethics is anchored in some kind of unique superior value which itself remains free from questioning, a value such as God, life, nature, human dignity, autonomy, property. This superior value then serves as an orientation point for the formulation of a moral code, a code which stipulates on universalizable judgment, that is what must and mustn't be done under all possible circumstances. And, um, this, I mean, I developed this argument as a critique of bioethics in my 2009 book uh, called Bioethics in the Age of New Media, which came out from the MIT Press. And what I'm understanding by bioethics there is, on the one hand, what is understood by bioethics in a conventional sense, ethics related to kind of medical practice and now increasingly kind of the biotechnological world. At the same time, I tried to push that definition, going to the etymology of the bios and, you know, seeing bios as life in its kind of political context and then linking it with Zoe, kind of raw life, basic life. So it kind of becomes, for me, bioethics becomes uh, in response to the more, what I call, conventional bioethical frameworks, which most of them derive from different forms of, philosophy, of moral philosophy, becomes a different mode of, of thinking about life and a relation to life with life as part of life. So in the book I argued that such normative, procedural, 
value-driven bioethics is not adequate for a complex democratic society whose very own signal points such as life, intelligence and the human are undergoing a series of technological transformations as well as existing in a series of antagonistic relations between holders of divergent positions on life. For example, those who see the fetus as a future human and those and thus having an inalienable life, right to life versus those for whom the fetus is a collection of cells which lack sovereign existence and about which decisions are to be made by its physical carrier. So, as you know, an abortion, the abortion example is always a good example to show uh, what could be described as this kind of democratic paradox, the impossibility on the part of, of usually both sides, including the liberals who usually think of themselves as a more open-minded, being able to, to cope with different positions, to kind of uh, think themselves out of the moral impasse in which they find themselves. So it's a kind of example that I'm... Um, putting on the table here as, uh, as an illustration of what I mean, that kind of the moral impasse uh, through which we often walk. And there are many examples like this. The abortion is an easy one. To take this argument further, I want to suggest that conventional bioethics as an ethics of life is, that is amenable to prior judgment and reasoned argument falters when facing many bioart projects. Indeed, it can only approach them by retreating to the rather conventional definitions of life, nature, and the human. Definitions which artists, scientists, and engineers, whose research the former incorporate into their practice, are in the process of radically reformulating. So the artist's intervention into life, matter, and intelligence, and into the discourse on those issues, can serve as a contaminant of the liberal consensus thanks to which we all supposedly know what life and intelligence are, how it should be protected. As I say, debates about abortion, euthanasia, or keeping dolphins in enclosures show that this is clearly not the case, that we don't really know. And bioart of this kind can show us the fragility of and frequent hypocrisy behind our supposed consensus. So our human engagement with the matter of life and the life of matter is never just a form of rational deliberation. It's also an affective transmutation which requires in um, making changes to the material arrangements of the world, which is to say to the negotiators' bodies and minds and to the very material dynamics of life that shapes them. Bioart can therefore draw us out of our own intellectual and moral stupor and push us to make responsible critical interventions into the premises behind the liberal norms and values, which, when unquestioned, have the tendency to turn into moralist assumptions. And I suppose that's another reason uh, why I have problems with moral philosophy. Uh, morality, any kind of, of any ilk, any color, uh, has a, when, especially when unexamined, but even in, if examined, often has a tendency to turn into an ugly twin, which, which is moralism. And I'm very scared of moralism. The reason I'm working on ethics is precisely to, to find a way out of the many moralisms that are shaping our everyday existence. And let's say there's some forms of moralism many of us are well trained in noticing and working through. There are other forms of moralism that of which we can all participate in one way or another that are a little bit difficult to see. So, so moralism names a situation whereby moral reasoning gives way to embedded and frequently intransigent positions which manifest themselves in blanket bans, for example, on any kind of experimentation with or annihilation of life, on undermining human values, say, or on playing God, and even if it's a metaphor, and an oftentimes hysterical refusal to consider the lack of shared ground with one's opponents. Bioart is therefore capable of bringing to the fore the social antagonism that exists over various pre-biological and anti-scientific definitions of life, be it religiously inflected or secular, which are frequently spiked with some shards of metaphysics, life as a manifestation of God's breath, life as a precious original substance unifying all beings, life as a public sacrum. Such antagonism is inevitable in a liberal democratic society in which people of various religious and political orientations share social and cultural spaces. It is precisely in negotiating this antagonism over the meaning of life that bioart can help us with, although it also inevitably involves the possibility of adding to the antagonism 
by stirring passions and disturbing the majority consensus. Bioartistic experiments not only undermine the metaphysical understanding of life, but also challenge the traditional humanist value-based ethics, whereby this nebulous entity called human life is posited as a value in advance, something to be protected at all costs. We could perhaps argue that bioart has the power to become involved in the performative enactment of life as such. It can be understood as a form of ongoing golem making. This power manifests itself in being able to pose or even force questions about the meaning of life at its material level, about the boundaries of living organisms and the relations between them and their environment, and last but not least, about the connections between the postulated autonomy and hence self-ownership of living organisms and the possibility of patenting on commercializing various life forms. Naturally, we don't need bioart to do this. Biotechnology itself is perfectly capable of raising critical questions of the kind, of this kind, and of creating fundamental problems for our established ideas of life. In its attempt to clone living organisms, endow inanimate domestic objects such as toasters and fridges with intelligence, and create artificial life, it realigns the boundaries of metaphysics with its technical interventions into the living and the non-living. Yet bioart is uniquely placed to undertake this kind of questioning knowingly and purposefully, since it lacks the pragmatic imperative of many science and technology projects, whereby innovation and economic growth frequently overshadow any non-goal-oriented agendas. Although the, the, the two are often developed, like um, you know, projects uh, technologizing life and marketizing it, and bioart projects often develop from within the same labs and as part of the same research grants. I mean, most of these bioartists are part of research institutions of universities. It's very difficult to kind of make uh, especially complex bioart bio on your own. Uh, it's also very dangerous politically, as Steve Kurtz of Critical Art Ensemble uh, found out, having found himself subject to FBI interrogation for a long period of time. So the prime is so even though the two are often developed from within the same labs, bioart's mission is ostensibly different from the one embraced by the biotech industry. The primary business of bioart is the representation, articulation, and open-ended creation of new forms and modes of life, and new forms and modes of inquiry into life, which is perhaps even the more interesting thing. Maybe the actual representations or articulations it creates in matter are not that interesting. Sometimes it's on the level of the actual, um, of the, of the um, parenthetical articulation as a philosophical discourse, it becomes more interesting. But its business certainly is in the kind of capital-induced production of life trademarked, the way Craig Ventner and other venture capitalists seem to see it. So to return to the question of bioartists' rights and obligations, I'd like to rephrase it here as a question of taking responsibility for life. I want to suggest that far from being immoral or irresponsible, artists experimenting with life are themselves performatively engaged, not just in enacting life differently, but also in enacting a different ethics of life. In the same way, the 16th century Rabbi Loeb supposedly played God and created his golem in order to protect the lives of his fellow citizens in the Prague ghetto. There's a little break, so in, to those of you who are not familiar with these projects, the first one is also Eduardo Katz's uh, GPF bunny. The bunny wasn't really that green, that's probably a Photoshop image. Um, the bunny. Um, Eduardo Katz has injected uh, the bunny with a green protein, one uh, regularly used in science research to identify a control group, and, and, um, and when you shine ultraviolet light on it, it kind of glows a little bit. And the, the story of Alba, that was the bunny's name, was almost as interesting and as successful as the bunny itself. And the other project is a collaboration between Stellark and Tissue Culture and Arts, or on Katz, and it's a kind of quarter ear project uh, grown out of tissue. So through their practice, artists give shape to a new biotechnological framework for thinking what it means to live a good life and to make life 
good literally. It's precisely the inventive, creative aspect of bioart, its ability to enact new possibilities in and for life that for me situates it within an ethical horizon. Yet as stated earlier, this is not to designate any form of novelty or creative endeavor as a valuable or good per se, not to say any form of unfolding. I'm not the kind of vitalist of the affirmative kind that has em the trend has emerged from recent readings, I would say misreadings of Deleuze, um, where you know, any form of emergence is seen as interesting in itself. I mean, um, so this is not to suggest that, only to draw attention to an inherently creative potential of bioart, no matter whether it's actually going to be actualized in individual works or not. In remolding life, bioartists can't therefore be judged by the established normative criteria which correspond to entities and the world presumed to be a certain way if they themselves are involved, at the core level we might say, in transforming the very fundamentals of that world. As well as reinventing life, bioartists may therefore be offering us a way of reinventing life's norms and our conceptualizations of it. I should perhaps make a quick reservation here that I'm not an uncritical apologist for bioart as such. Indeed, I readily acknowledge that the much of the work that falls into the category of bioart is not that interesting on its own terms. Too derivative with regard to biotechnology and bioscience, too fascinated with the technical process, too focused on the pedagogic aspects of bringing science to the people, too insular in its own preoccupations with technical details. Yet it's precisely the perhaps rare, but nevertheless transformative bioartistic events, by which I don't mean just installations or performances taking place in galleries, but primarily the convergence of forces in the world when a particular bioart project disturbs something in the arrangements of this world. So this is this kind of transformative bioartistic bio events. That's, this is where, for me, a bioethical potential of bioart comes to the fore. It's when bioart takes responsibility for life without retreating to any predefined, entrenched, moralist possessions about what this life is and how it should be treated that contours for a new paradigm for an ethics of life in the biotech era are being drawn, I would suggest, although always impermanently. To return to the Crude Matter project by Katz and Zer, the artists are, of course, reluctant to postulate any outright ban on the manipulation of life since it would be difficult to justify, ethically and politically, the cause of such a ban without resorting to unexamined metaphysical assumptions or just to a moral panic. Obviously, moral panics are a very quick, frequent reaction to when it comes to the matter of, of, matter of manipulating life, death, intelligence, anything. So at the same time, the Australian-based duo foregrounds the issue of human responsibility for the knowledge about life while also highlighting the human hubris which manifests itself in some of the applications of this knowledge. What projects of this kind enact is therefore a new understanding of the context for life. The artists don't eschew responsibility for their practices or pronouncements, but this responsibility focuses on one fundamental question or meta-question, we might say. What does it actually mean to bear responsibility towards life? We could understand this question to be driven by an imperative to consider what it actually means to invent life well. This imperative also requires us to reflect on how this responsibility for life can be enacted, given that the very substrate for which responsibility is to be taken is in the process of being remolded. We are therefore faced here with an ontological paradox. At the very heart of the bioethics enacted by many bioart projects lies an empty signifier that nevertheless exudes a content-free obligation to respond to it and take responsibility for it. Obviously, in particular circumstances, this empty signifier, life, gets filled with specific content. Our response to such content is always marked ethically, even if it's not always ethical in itself. In contemporary critical thought, there has been a tendency, driven by the work of Spinoza and Deleuze, to see such ethical responses primarily as 
affective reactions. To make here a quick um, reservation that uh, if some of you are allergic to the word Deleuze, as some people are, this is actually a critique of uh, Deleuze's take on ethics. I have a lot of respect and time for Deleuze, but I don't think that uh, Deleuze or the Spinoza-Deleuze mix can offer us um, you know, adequate answers when it comes to ethics. So I'm just uh, making this little reservation. So. There has been a tendency, at least in contemporary crit critical thought, at least in the kind of with my playgrounds, which are you know, um, kind of art domain, media theory, con co um, continental philosophy. It's been a turn to Deleuze and to kind of Deleuze and Spinoza's ethics, and seeing ethical responses, affective reactions, whereby what happens to a living body after it has entered into a composition with other bodies and whether it enhances or reduces its capabilities and potential energy has been deemed as an, 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 adequate, as an adequate indicator of a good relation. The good is when a body directly compounds its relation with others, with ours, and with all or part of its power increases ours, as Deleuze puts it in his book Spinoza. So in this context, ethics is defined as a form of ethology, which with regard to men and animals, in each case only considers their capacity for being affected." Unquote. Rather than reacting to a given situation, a gesture that can perhaps be seen as secondary or passive, and that would surely sound like anathema to many of our bio-artists bio discussed in this chapter, ethics in the Deleuzean framework should be active focused on production for the sake of production itself, an ungrounded time and becoming. If life is understood as an ongoing and dynamic technical process, then an ethical imperative lies in creating new, interesting ways of becoming and of being part of this life. In this sense, bioartists such as Katz and Zer, or Eduardo Katz, can be said to be acting ethically in their ethological, life-altering adventures and experiments with the previously raised question of responsibility relegated to the treasure chest of old, responsive and passive forms of morality. However, I would argue that not only is the above delineated position on ethics not entirely satisfactory, but also that the bioartist under discussion can be said to be ethical in a much stronger sense, which I will outline in the final part of my talk. Let me start by contending that the partly embodied and affective nature of our relatedness to life can't be denied. The disembodied rational moral subject of traditional ethics, which could supposedly take on objective and impartial stand on issues via logical deliberation, has been exposed to be nothing more than a fantasy by a number of different academic disciplines. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody has taken on this critique, but I have. So. Yet, I also want to suggest that this entering into a relation with other bodies, situated as they are in a field of forces in which such an encounter happens, also requires what I term a cut to be made into this field. The function of this cut is to allow first for these and not some other relations to be recognized as individual relations, and second, for at least provisional judgments to be made about those relations. The situation as such demands an assessment from the human who is capable not only of recognizing in him or herself this propensity for being affected, but also theorizing this propensity. The cut referred here to here therefore stands for a reflexive moment in which an evaluation is to be made about the powerfulness of an encounter between particular elements, bodies, and about the supposed goodness of this encounter. To judge this increase in our power, or even to actually understand who is the we in this relation, a moment of at least temporary differentiation between different parts of the assemblage has to occur. If ethics is not to turn merely into a formal exercise in the study of life flows increase and decrease, one needs to be able to determine why some bodily encounters matter more than others and who they matter to at any particular time. This ethical bind, if we want to call it this, is made apparent in a project called In Vitro by the Australian artist Tash Bates, a project which examines the evolution of somatic semantics, or ways of understanding, through bodies. The work consists of two durational life performances, 
occurring in two different locations, a science lab at the University of Western Australia and a public studio at Perth Institute of Contemporary Art. Focusing on embodied affective encounters between various organisms commonly used in reproductive biology and housed in customized glass vessels, such as, for example, fruit, li fruit flies, thrush, slime mold, and the artist herself, Homo sapiens sapiens, it explores what Bayes describes as the aesthetics of care, where in, which investigates the potential that sustained proximity and care can offer in exploring the relationship between the carer and cared for. Even though it remains open to the processes of emergence and the unfolding of different relations between living organisms, in vitro is also framed by a series of prior questions that call to responsibility the artist's relation to life. What does it mean to care for fruit flies, slime mold, Daphnia, Hydra, or soil nematodes in a gallery? Is it possible to develop a different relationship between Candida albicans, commonly known as thrush, and humans by caring for it? How do we care for creatures that are not cute, fairy, or even visible? Is it appropriate or ethical to contain organisms in glass terrariums and keep them for our own purposes, aesthetic, cultural, educational, scientific? It is therefore clearly not just how the various organisms are mutually affected in the encounter that is being assessed in the project, but also how, through recourse to species singularity, not to be confused with species superiority, species singularity, the Homo sapiens participant can perform a reflection on the established relations, on how they unfold, on what they mean, and on whether they could and should be altered. We could perhaps go so far as to suggest that artists experiment, artistic experiments of this kind furnish what might be described as an ethics lab, whereby it's not just life that is experimented on, but also the normative frameworks through which it can be approached and dealt with. If acting ethically means making cuts to the flow of life, as we said earlier, then we need to acknowledge that those cuts are going to be both material, involving the cutting and splicing of genes or cells, and rhetorical. In performing bioethics with their work, bioartists seem to be taking heed of Deleuze and Guattari's philosophical imperative to approach problems of the world not just by saying what we already know about it, but first of all by inventing new concepts, a process for which the authors of what is philosophy is a matter of articulation, of cutting and cross-cutting. Bioart can therefore be described as being involved in twin processes of inventing life and cutting through life, with a double-edged scalpel of responsibility and necessity. This is to say that cutting, both material and rhetorical, is inevitable, but also that the kinds of incisions that we are going to make into life matter. Indeed, they matter also in an ethical sense, which will have to be decided anew in various contexts. Since this nebulous entity called life is itself in the process of being recreated in the artistic experiments and their articulations, there is of course no reason to posit life as a value in advance. As Rosie Bridotti argues, life is a fundamentally amoral force, the true nature of which is best expressed in its relentless generative power. There is no implicit a priori difference between cancer and birth or between a malignant proliferation of cells and cancer and the benign proliferation induced by pregnancy. Seeing life as a force, a dynamic movement, an unfolding of potentialities which are often unknown in advance, carries with it both a suspension of ontological certainty and an ethical imperative to cut well into life, to make good things with it. Rather than be posited as a prior value, Life here becomes a minimum condition of any ethical framework and of there being those who can exercise and act on that condition. To cite Bridotti again, ethics is a thin barrier against the possibility of extinction. It's a mode of, actu of actualizing sustainable forms of transformation. So I'm kind of just wrapping up now. It's therefore the protection of this condition and of the possibility of lives unfolding that constitutes what we might term the first minor injunction of any kind of non-procedural bioethics. This injunction always needs to be coupled with two others, to cut well into life and to respond well to life already formed. 
or as we may also put it, temporarily stabilized. And obviously, what does it mean to respond well? The whole notion of the well would need to be contextualized, kind of put to um, the discussion, put into more than a discussion, put into the kind of affective set of, set of relationships in which uh, the enactment of that prior responsibility called for by life can be uh, realized. So. Um, it also means taking responsibility for the life of the other, be it another human, a golem, or a slime mold, but not necessarily in the same way. So the imperative and propensity for inventing well, and as I say, this well is not endowed yet with any kind of predecided notion of good, um, is derived from humans' capacity for developing empathy with other life forms, for being sentient with and about them, and for being able to theorize this shared sentience. However, it's precisely the moment of reflection on that capacity and the forms of affect it generates that is a condition for any such living encounter being ethical. Otherwise, there is a danger of, say, cuteness becoming a moral value. We could therefore suggest that bioartists busying themselves in their ethics labs are 21st century science philosophers who, like Rabbi Lowe with his golem, are both making life and making rules about life. But they do need to take responsibility for their own situatedness in life, for their engagement with matter, and for their differentiation from it. Of course, as we said earlier, not all bio-artists are ethical in this sense, with many reneging on the minimal critical vitalist imperative, we could say it in inverted commas, to create life and to reflect on it. But the interesting, even if rare, examples of good invention can turn bioart into an important tester of our moral hierarchies, of how we value certain life forms more than others, and of how we cut through matter to make life better. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, illuminating and I would say also really controversial topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now it's time to comment it. Have a great deal. All right. Uh, yeah, I have to, to second that very eloquent and, and illuminating at the same time. Uh, very well done. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's always refreshing to, to in, in meetings like this to, uh, to see uh, people uh, sh share intuitions and ideas, but also concerns, you know, that is, we, we all come from very, very different, as you said, uh, different disciplinary backgrounds. And we might use different vocabularies, but behind those vocabularies and terms and, and concepts, there are always similar ideas. I think, I mean, that the, the beauty of, of uh, and the uh, usefulness of meetings like this uh, is that uh, it allows that that kind of, uh, you know, uncovers the, the similarities. And, and we have, you know, to thank the organizers again for, for making this, this possible. Um, I really mean that. Uh, I, I, I have uh, uh, learned that this kind of interdisciplinary meeting uh, is always much more, more uh, you know, refreshing and useful than, than, than other ones, the more disciplinary ones. I want to highlight uh, three major themes that, that uh, Joanna uh, brought up. Again, I'm not an art critic, and I don't... Uh, uh, I appreciate art very much, I, but uh, I spare you from my comments about art because I don't have that kind of skill. But uh, there are three themes that I, that uh, very much resonate with uh, with me in terms of the uh, you know the, the, again the ideas and and concerns, and I want to to point those out. Uh, so uh, these are basically the point about materiality, the point about flow and process and cut, and the point about ethics. Uh, so starting with materiality, you, you humbly said that maybe you don't need to bring to, to point out to AI researchers that that you know uh, you know that materiality matters. Um, I want to to actually to encourage you to do more of this because uh, uh, we are as as you know we are uh, if not fighting we are working against uh, a very uh, deeply entrenched tradition of, if not going back to Plato, but at least to, to Descartes. And, uh, 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 you know, it's amazing how, how influential this, uh, the, what, whatever we call it, dualism or mentalism, uh, is in, in the way we think about, uh, you know, ourselves and about the world and so on. Uh, to give you just one example, 
uh, I usually ask in, in, in some of the sessions in my class, my students, give me examples of what you think human cognition is. And guess what types of you know, things they mention. It's reasoning, consciousness, uh, you know, uh, memory, and so on. They almost never talk about action or as, as part of cognition or, you know, uh, the, the material aspect of cognition. I take that as a good indication that of, of this influence that, that I'm pointing out, that it is very much with us and it is never enough to basically to remind ourselves and others that, that uh, cognition is material, thinking is material, and information is material. Uh, we, we all have heard, the, you know, we heard about the talk this morning uh, from Gertzel, but also, you know, many of you, many of you are familiar with Ray Kurzweil uh, work, uh, which is pretty much basically uh, based on this this uh, this uh, ephemeral understanding of, of information as if you can detach information from its material base and make it flow you know through systems without without uh, without this uh, material support and I think uh, that these issues are not conceptually in my understanding I apologize if there are people who are who are of that school of thought I mean not only they are misguided conceptually they are already also practically uh, misguided. That is, they, they lead to conclusions and to investments uh, and al resource allocations that are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, justified. Uh, the point about uh, information again uh, reminded me of Susan Oyama's work. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar yes, with the yes. ontogeny of mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is one of the very first people in, in biology, as a philosopher of biology, who wrote mm -hmm. about the, you know, the, 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 this notion that, that you mentioned that's, you know, for instance, that uh, uh, cells do not develop just just because of ge their genetic code. There's the uh, the environment and the, mm -hmm. the, you know the, the context that makes a huge difference. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that these the theme of materiality is coming up in different places. Whether we are talking about information or biology or genetic code or even about you know uh, the, the point uh, that was that Sanders made earlier about you know the fact that our interactions uh, with, with with the digital environment. Uh, are, are very much material, but it is it is presented to us. It is c conceived as being as being uh, immaterial. And I, I'll, I'll come back to this point uh, if I get the chance later on. Uh, moving on to the second point about flow, I, uh, that kind of thinking, as I pointed out yesterday, is is very much in tune with the way I I like to think about con topics and issues and so on. Uh, this unfolding of life from Bergson is is very fascinating. I think uh, life unfolds not only uh, in this biological manner, uh, and I, I find that a very, a very useful way of thinking about it, but also un unfolds in a different manner in this, in this digital environment. And I think it, it's very useful to think about how our actions uh, uh, in, in these environments also unfold, creating uh, a certain kind of life experience that is, that is uh, really um, Invisible, unexpected, uncertain to um, to to us and, and and to others, and I find that uh, not only as a metaphor but uh, uh, but also as a way of thinking very useful. Uh, but at the same time, the em your, uh, the emphasis that you put on cut, I think that's also very useful because if if we think about issues only in terms of flow, uh, we lose support. You know, we, there, there's uh, you know you cannot you cannot conceptualize, you cannot understand and explain things just as simple flows or as, as purely flow. There's always some stabilization, as you mentioned yesterday in your comments. Uh, um, and cut, the notion of cut, I think, is very, uh, really, very important for that purpose. Uh, finally, in terms of ethics, uh, I couldn't agree more with you in terms of the, you know, the, the failure of moral philosophy uh, as traditionally uh, practiced um, in, in bringing out uh, the, the issues that contemporary human beings are uh, are facing. Uh, I'm very much influenced uh, in, in, I'm not an ethicist, but I'm very influenced by by the work and writings of the, this French sociologist who, who call themselves prag pragmatic sociologists, uh, Boltansky, Savona, and, and others. And they have a very, a very useful, uh, well, uh, more than useful, I think a very elegant uh, uh, framework of, of that not only uh, relates to ethics, uh, but also relates uh, to to social interaction and and social just you know uh, uh, behavior and so on. 
And uh, just to give you an example, I think one of the concepts that I found, find useful in them, and it, it, in my mind, it's, uh, it's very uh, close to, to, uh, to your thinking, is this notion of engagement, that is, we, that is, as human beings, we engage with the real and the good of the world uh, at the same time. If uh, the, the problem with moral philosophy is that it emphasized, by emphasizing the good, it lost sense and, and uh, view of, of the real. And I think this goes back to the theme of materiality again, that you, know, you cannot explain and understand human behavior just in terms of the good. You have to also pay attention to the real. Mm -hmm. And with that, I just want to, to thank you again for a very, very illuminating, uh, and as, as Michael said, talk and presentation. Thank you. Uh, Julia. Yes, well, thank you very much for your very generous comments, Hamid. I've got uh, very quick responses just to kind of get the conversation going. Around materiality, then I have to make a, another disciplinary confession. From uh, I appreciate what you are saying, and obviously I'm aware of the certain erasure of materiality from some kind of quarters around artificial intelligence research. At the same time, from my area, which is, as I said, looking around media, cultural theory, art theory, continental philosophy, there seems to be, a, you know, materiality is a new buzzword, and it can be as oppressive and as unthinking in its adoption of that concept as its erasure in some other disciplines. So on the one hand, I want to those kind of work with materiality. On the other hand, I'm slightly concerned around there seems to be a mantra that we need to return to materiality in our discipline as well. And obviously, inadvertently, I myself kind of use these figures because you know, we've got the language we've got, and you can, can't always qualify and put under erasure every sentence you utter. However, this whole materiality thing it troubles me because because I'm not sure whether we've ever actually, in the areas I'm with, we've ever left it behind. And this return to materiality or turn to materiality is posited in, in cultural theory as a kind of overcoming of the so-called linguistic turn, which I think is a kind of phantom of some people who didn't probably read, I don't know, of grammatology correctly, I think. Because if you read of grammatology, and I don't think it's a kind of Derrida's brick work. I don't think everyone should read grammatology. I mean, people can read lots of different things and get to different places. Uh, but if you do read grammatology, if you happen to read it, it is a very good account of materiality and precisely how the language is embedded in material. It's a very logical book, again, contrary to what people say. It requires some time, to, but it is logical. It's a very kind of thorough account. I like Derrida for his logic. I also like logic. It's another confession to all my philosophical erasures. I actually have a lot of respect for logic, and that's a part of analytical philosophy I do appreciate. So, and uh, so there is that kind of uh, material, and turn to materiality can be as oppressive, as anti-intellectual, as a kind of running away or forgetting of it. The second point about flows, again, obviously, I absolutely agree. I am concerned about this notion of life continuism or kind of species continuism, and it being again, I think for me, it emerges from certain. Perhaps misreadings, perhaps, you know, alternative, I don't know whether misreadings as in certain types of readings of Bergson and Deleuze where it becomes, you know, the flow. There is also a very easy way of incorporating that language into the language of capital. You know, everything flows, everything can be connected to that kind of constant uh, notion of us all being there. The discourse is almost imposed upon us from elsewhere. The only thing we, we can do is join with the flow, basically. And as a both on a philosophical and a kind of experiential level, I'd like to resist that a bit. And that notion of the cat, for me, is precisely a moment of this temporary stabilization. And I think it ties in with the notion of quasi-objects that you talked about in the search. It's precisely that this is quasi-object. It's always already something else. It's always already in relation to something else. And it, you know, by the time you've looked at it and blinked, it has become another quasi-object and another set of relationships. But there isn't just relationality. And it's, that's another mantra from my... Uh, my thing. So I, I use the word relationality a lot, but you know something emerges, something is produced, we produce something. And I think we humans are probably a very small class of actors that are having effects or producing something in the world. I mean, say the universe carried without us very happily, the universe will carry without us very happily. So any interventions we make, you know, our hubris aside, are kind of minimal. But those we, we, we do make, we are also in a position of being able to give an account for them and, you know, philosophy philosophy is a name for that discipline that allows you to give an account for cuts you make into the world. And then, yes, the, the kind of uh, traditional ethics and the relation of engagement. Yes, I'm just concerned about the kind of proceduralism of many traditional forms, especially of bioethics, where it almost becomes, it's, you know, serve, it is in the service of uh, 
many biotech companies, for example, that you know it is supposed to get scientists, researchers, uh, um, companies off the hook, basically. But the kind of uh, it's not to say that all forms of bioethics are like that. Of course, there are a lot of other theorists who are driven by very different concerns. But proceduralism is one thing that worries me. And another thing that really worries me is this stretched scale of personhood. This is the term I used in my crit earlier critique of Peter Singer and other uh, moral philosophers who could be considered as being quite radical, you know, going beyond this um, very uh, protectionist notion of life, if you like. And yet, I still think there is a certain conservatism in it. And I think, I, in some sense, this is something I'm seeing in a lot of the development of discourses around artificial intelligence, where the human in its stretched format, still becomes a model, a reference point. So the stretched scale of personhood is, for me, a, a kind of a problematic concept. And I'm wondering whether, rather than just stretch that scale, we could actually really genuinely rethink it, work through it. Uh, just very quickly, uh, uh, your, your point about buzzwords is very well taken. I, I, I very much agree that you know we tend to, in, in academia especially, but in, uh, more generally in intellectual environments, if you tend to, uh, you know, to jump on these bandwagons uh, of, of that, that uh, just appear every once in a while, and materiality is one of them, as if, uh, you know, it, it, is, it doesn't exist. So I, I, I want to reiterate what you said. I, I very much agree that one has to be very cautious and careful in not, not overstretching and, and, you know, pushing things too far. As, uh, you know, uh, that's always a good caution. Thank you. I think I, I can open a discussion because uh, I think in our mind, minds there has emerged a lot of interesting questions should be asked now. So. Uh, well, thank you for a very, very interesting talk. As somebody who's actually working in a sense as a bioethicist, I couldn't agree more, but there is a, a great deal of problem with how we do with bioethics. I don't think it's because uh, we bioethicists have been brought up by companies to justify mm. their business. I think the real problem is, of course, we've been brought up by academia. We yeah. want to do bioethics because it gives us job security. Every time there is a new result and we can say this raises serious concerns, we get to put, uh, be in more meetings, more conferences, and more nice language. Yeah. But that's, of course, a problem with a lot of academic disciplines. We create our own work and we exaggerate our own importance. What we hear, there is this problem, of course, there is an impotence of a lot of ethical thinking. We mm -hmm. might do good ethical thinking, but it might actually not affect society very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where I think ethical thinking is really important, that we might actually have a good theory about it. Although that might not necessarily guide the policy, at least it has some chance of fixing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Kevin Warwick is not here now, and I don't know when he actually talked about it in his presentation. But I think he actually did, did, did a good demonstration of how you can tweak ethics in an interesting way. To some extent, his experiment in front of himself was a kind of empirical ethics. He demonstrated that this is an ethical issue because I'm doing it right now. Mm -hmm. you, can, you cannot argue that what I'm doing is science fiction because I actually got to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. In a sense, he was also creating his own ethical problem, although uh, being a professor in cybernetics, he doesn't really need that. He, he has other goals. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a important here about actually deficit getting engaged with the technology too. Uh, for example, again, in my own research, how much should I be allowed to try cognitive enhancing drugs when I'm writing about the ethics of using them? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're having an experience about something normally is regarded as being quite good. A parent who happens to be an ethicist and writes about parenting ethics will say, that's personal experience, that's useful. Mm -hmm. Except that we will also say, Bias. But a good ethics argument would be kind of invariant. You would say, yeah, the argument is valid, although the author is completely biased. That's like you might say that every artist is really biased about mm -hmm. this. So finally, just a small point about an earlier point, but I think this is a bit of a paradox about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So Star Wars has this very vitalistic view of the force. Mm -hmm. uh, living beings are encompassed by the force, and it's clearly all about living beings. Droids don't have any rights. Mm -hmm. Yet, you could argue that the droids of Star Wars, at least some of them, are real heroes. Important mm -hmm. characters actually carry through the trilogy of Hexagon, mm -hmm. Hexagon, without being part of the force. 
it's almost mm -hmm. on the mind itself. Mm -hmm. Whether that mm -hmm. is because the authors didn't think about it, whether the author is never an hour, like the force might not be, but now all of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But it actually shows a true matter, at least in the Star Wars universe, can be heroic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for these comments. And, you know, in relation to the first point, yes, absolutely. My main beef with bioethics is absolutely not to do with uh, its incorporation by kind of biotech companies. My main problems are philosophical, especially around the... Uh, the the moral subject that is evoked the kind of often remains un, unreconstructed in many of the of the kind of uh, propositions made there so that is it would be uh, I also is another I'm in a very confessional mood today so I'll make another confession I actually believe that the work of, of policy bodies and bioethics policy bodies I think is important and things that we need I believe in regulation as well lots of different like I was for you know levels and regulation of the press for example so it's lots of things I do believe in, in some uh, kind of uh, minor or strategic, uh, strategic interventions to the material arrangements of the here and now. So, however, for me, what a lot of these bioethics bodies do is the work of policy and politics. So, in a way, what's missing for me from a lot of them is a prior ethical reflection of the kind of way I understand it, it's like taking responsibility for responsibility, uh, responding to that obligation of life. And for me, that obligation, and I'm kind of very loosely deriving it from Levinas while ditching his, uh, his humanism. Some people see it as a crazy and impossible uh, way of thinking. I think I've spent, I've, I've written loads of pages trying to justify it can work. I'm not sure it was a successfully or convincingly. I've kind of convinced myself myself so far and you know, maybe a few other people along the way but basically there's a sense of responsibility once you're born into the world you have to respond to language to touch to other so, so there being alterity that alterity is sometimes human it touches you it touches you physically metaphorically it shapes you in a certain way you know you learn how to walk you recognize shapes in the world you gain the whole kind of body envelope around yourself so all that so that responsibility you have to respond and obviously only some of these responses will be ethical and you can reject that responsibility which will already be but that is kind of for me the sense of ethics this need to respond and at some point we can all we can make that response as well because verbal and articulate and we can develop it and, and you know put it in certain forms of languages we can even go and study philosophy and reflect in some way although we don't need to study philosophy to to conduct I think ethical forms of ethical reflection so there is so that my bigger problem is around that uh, the lack of the prior reflection of the kind of forms of responsibility around that and the positing of a certain moral subject which is an entity and I think there is there is that uh, for me that moral subject. So I don't want moral, you know, species continuism or life continuism. Don't want this vital flow. But neither do I want an, an, a separate moral entity. So again, what do I want? I think a cut in the flow of life. And that's why, in a way, for me, most ethical, you know, traditional ethical theories fall apart. I think I want to be reinventing ethics. At the moment, I'm doing this project on it's called uh, it's a cosmic ethics, ethics for the whole universe. Now, again, I don't want to save the whole universe. That's why I've got problems with, with Star Wars. I kind of I'm slightly scared of heroes and Jesuses and all these with a mission to save humanity. So my my new book is called Minimal Ethics for the Anthropocene. The new geological epoch, which you know might be happening, might not be happening, in which you know the we are changing. Apparently, we've changed the biosphere, the geosphere to such an extent we need to do something. But it's minimal ethics. I'm trying to say the least I can, and then I will fall silent about ethics once I've done this. But without you know losing sight of the complexity and complexity that I've learned from biology and also from the languages of computer science. I'm not sure if we have enough time for one more question. So maybe we have a few more minutes. Oh, okay, okay. So thank you, thank you, Jonah, for your talk. I would just like to comment on one of the last slides uh, where you cited the text uh, stating that there's no inherent or implicit a priori difference between living organisms and malignant tumors or, or cancer or something like this was there. I think I, I'm I can't agree with this because I would like to. Uh, point out the cybernetical view of living organisms or living mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. that says that uh, a living organism, well, it's uh, yeah, a living organism is such a system that utilizes a negative, uh, in, a negative informational feedback mm -hmm. for the self-regulation, mm -hmm. or in other words, uh, 
the living organisms are teleological systems, like mm -hmm. locus driven systems, as opposed to the blindly causal uh, physical non living systems. Mm -hmm. I like to um, uh, remind the, the seminal paper of Norbert Wiener and Arthur mm -hmm. Rosenblitz mm -hmm. from 1943, mm -hmm. where they um, sort of uh, discuss the the difference between uh, causal and teleological systems, where the teleological mm -hmm. system have this negative information feedback mm -hmm. or self-regulation, and I would so I, I would I would just point out that you know the the cancer or these malignant tissues they've got these feedbacks broken. Mm -hmm. I mean this is what makes them different from the properly living organisms who really are still between the art of steering mm -hmm. be, uh, between, as I've already said, the skill of cancer mm -hmm. and heritage of dementia, or I mean, skill mm -hmm. of uncontrolled growth mm -hmm. and uh, heritage of un un uncontrolled genocide. Mm -hmm. of sure. So I think mm -hmm. this is a kind of, I would say, cancer or tumor is a quasi-living organism. It's made of maybe living cells, mm -hmm. but as the whole, I would not say it's a living organism, it's mm -hmm. something broken. So maybe many pieces of the bio art are not living organisms no. as well. They no, no. No, that's... Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the term they are not. No, they are not. And cancer by itself isn't. It's part of an organism on which or with which it lives, absolutely. The term that Oren Kass and Jonat Zer use is the semi-living. And they kind of have worked with this concept quite interestingly, precisely working through this. However, the bigger point, I... I understand your point, and I have to say I disagree in the sense that, uh, for me, it's a formal distinction between these different uh, different kinds of life. And I think to posit it like this, you already need to prevalorize kind of life as movement forward and as such kind of sustaining a certain existence as a value to be able to retain that. However, if we don't, if we kind of step aside, if that was really possible, then I think that wouldn't be an issue for me. So that kind of teleology for me kind of isn't there, it's just put in there. And and then we kind of treat it as if it was there and we can sustain these distinctions. But it's just about how we see the universe and what we see with entities and how they function and whether they are in our heads or out there. So thank you very much once again for